two hours late. I know. It's her fault. She got the money. Two grand. Hallelujah. You're my Savior, man. The only person of Jesus Christ. He did God using that. I don't know. It's never happened. It doesn't exist. But something wrong, man? And you look a little whiter than usual. Like a machine gun. You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or still dreaming? All the time. It's called mescaline. It's the only way to fly. It just sounds to me like you might need to unplug, man. You know, get some more R&R. Let me think for sure. Should we take a moment? Definitely. I can't. I have uh, work tomorrow. Why? It'll be fun. I promise. <laughs> I was you on my computer. How did you do that? Right now, all I can tell you is that you're in danger. I brought you here to warn you. What? They're watching you, Leah. Who is? Jesus. All right. We're ready to go. I thought I'd get a little matrix in for you. Let me shut that off now. Just wanted to warm you up. Matrix has a special place in my uh, movie experience. That's the first, that DVD you're watching is the first DVD I ever bought. First one ever. Saw the movie in 99. Whenever it came out on DVD is when I got it. I got a DVD player. And that DVD you're watching, I, I'm going to guess it came out in 2000 or something like that. First DV, DVD I ever got. So, hello, everyone. Uh, who's we got? Jem Jem, Dee Dee, Shannon, Tara, Stephanie, Joyce, Emily. Hello, Emily. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I was speaking to you earlier today. I hope everybody is doing great. And Angela, uh, I'm doing great. Uh, I spent um, uh, this past uh, weekend over in Orlando seeing my bro or my sister and her husband. They're down here from Ohio. And uh, they have a timeshare over there, so we had a good time over there and just kind of hung out, ate some ice cream, went for pizza. Um, just I went and played a little disc golf over there at uh, Bill Frederick Park. So I got a little bit of that in. It was a nice weekend, and uh, they're going to be coming over here on Friday uh, for a couple days, so that'll be nice. And who else we have? Kelly? So you did stay up, Kelly. Uh, welcome, uh, Charlie. Andrea and Diane. How's everybody doing tonight? I hope everybody's great. Um, what I'm wearing tonight, I got a little, the Rat Pack is back, sweatshirt on. It's a little chilly here tonight. Got sweatshirt on. Uh, one of the shirts that I have for my stage managing days in uh, Las Vegas. I worked that show from 2005 to 2009. In fact, I think I was wearing a Rat Pack shirt last week too. Okay. Boy, I must be a bachelor or something. Um, so it's good. It's good to be with all of you tonight. I I tell you uh, this after every program, every show that I do of this, 
This is my favorite time of the week. I love interacting with all of you. I love the questions uh, that you uh, send me, uh, the conversations that we have, and um, I really enjoy this. Uh, hi, hi, Diane. How are you doing? And Rachel's tuned in as well. Thanks uh, for everyone uh, for being here. Um, this is my favorite time of the week. Great. It's don't get me wrong. It's great when an episode come out comes out on Fridays, um, you know, because it's a lot of work, and that's the most important thing uh, that I do uh, that, and that we do. Um, but, um, I, I really enjoy this, getting this, uh, almost face-to-face, -face, uh, interaction with all of you. So I appreciate you, all of you giving me some of your time on a Wednesday night. Uh, Preston, good to see you. Kelly says it's 20 degrees in Western Pennsylvania. Glad I am not there. Uh, probably first and foremost, uh, when I was over in Orlando on Sunday, I'm sure some of you uh, read it or uh, saw the article. Maybe you haven't read it yet. Maybe at least saw the headline because I posted to it in the group. Uh, there was an article written about me and Unfound in the tr in the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh. It was on their site, triblive.com, and then it was also in the print edition. I want you to know, for the record, I had no idea that it was going to be on the front page right below, right above the fold. Uh, I guess you'd say the best place to be in any newspaper. I had no idea that they were going to do that. I have to uh, give the greatest thanks to Jennifer Bertetto, the CEO of Trib Total Media, and also uh, the writer who interviewed me last week and wrote the article. Uh, he did a great job. His name's Steve Huba, and he's the guy I'm going to be working with uh, with the Trib to do these missing persons cases from Western Pennsylvania. And in fact, that first article that I worked with him on is going to be coming out this Sunday, January 28th. It's the disappearance of Amy Pugner, who disappeared in Washington, PA, in 2010. Interesting case. Um, and in fact, um, uh, on Friday, after we do our regular episode, the disappearance of Nikki Wells is our disappearance this week. I interview her mother, Donna who just happens to live here in Florida. But after that, you're going to hear me interview Stephen uh, about the case that's going to be in uh, the Tribune Review and on TribLive.com. So there are actually going to be two interviews on Friday's program. We're going to have a regular show. After the interview, I'll do a little summation like I do, and then I'm going to go right into the interview that I conducted with Stephen, and I interview him. He interviewed me last week for the article in last week's uh, paper. I interview him so all of you can get a little bit of a heads up on what that uh, disappearance is a little bit about. So I hope you will listen to the entire program on Friday. It's going to be kind of unique and we're going to do that every time that the trip is going to have a missing persons case <clears throat> published. So once a month, that's the way the show is going to be. The Friday before the article comes out, I'm going to interview Steve about the case that we worked on together. And I will provide links and everything to that when it comes out on Sunday. Christina, welcome tonight. Uh, Tara, it was a pleasure uh, talking to your husband a couple days, or uh, yesterday, Tara. Uh, I thank him for that. And Dee Dee, there's, uh, there's uh, Wonder Woman. I, I'm absolutely going to share the links to the articles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, and Hannah, welcome uh, for uh, tuning, tuning in tonight. Good to see you. Um, yes, I want to make sure that everybody uh, across the United States and the world uh, goes to TribLive.com to see what the, the Trib is doing. Uh, to my knowledge, it is the only uh, media company in the United States, at least, that I know of that is going to dedicate itself in 2018 to covering, covering missing persons cases, old ones, cold cases from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I'm going to be working with, with uh, Stephen on that and his editor, Jim. And uh, so I want you all to uh, tune into that. Uh, I think it's uh, very important. Uh, I think it's very important what they're going to be doing. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, just to get the, the business stuff out of the way, and I already have a couple questions uh, for you. No, Christina, those are not uh, fall froth trophies, uh, disc golf trophies. Uh, two of them are. 
One is from drag racing and the other one is from a car show. I finally, uh, somebody had asked me that a couple weeks ago and I finally got it right. Um, one, two, uh, the one on the ends are from disc golf, the two in the middle. One is from drag racing and one is from a car show going way back, way back to my drag racing days in the 1990s. Um, the business stuff. Let's just get that out of the way. Of course, I always show you uh, the books. Let me get one of those. Of course, on Amazon. Hope you check that out. If you haven't, I hope you will. Volume one, still working on volume two. Just had, I've had so many things going on with the program, doing a lot of interviews, doing a lot of conversations. Uh, volume two, still working on it. And But volume one, I hope you check it out. You can actually contact me personally if you'd like to get a printed copy with me signing it inside or something like that, you can email me, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. I'll do that for you. And then, of course, there is the email ver- or the ebook version that you can get on Amazon. You can download it to your Kindle in a matter of moments. And like I said, volume two, I keep promising it. I'm working hard. That's all, that's all I can tell you. Uh, some of the other things, and because these um, – and Jill, welcome tonight. I uh, you had uh, heard you – or I should say, I saw you type uh, that you'd be joining us tonight. So, Jill, good to see you. And Stephanie, drag racing and IROC. Uh, Stephanie, I raced a lot of IROCs back in the day. I had a Mustang GT, and so I raced a lot of IROCs. I'm just telling you. And Sherelle, welcome tonight. Thanks for joining. Um, I just wrote these um, links out because I think this, this is a little better way to do this. Uh, for the playing cards, where are they? Where did I put them? Right here. Playing cards that I mention all the time. Right here. There you go. Makeplayingcards.com. Makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast is the link for that. And for merchandise, I haven't talked about this too much, but we have a lot of t-shirts. And I have almost all of the t-shirts done. Uh, so you want to go to, if you want to check that out, just to see what I'm doing over there. You're not, uh, you don't have to necessarily buy anything, but I just want you to see uh, what I'm doing. We got it right here. Unfound podcast, unfound-podcast.myshopify.com is where you'll find all the t-shirts that I've put together so far. And as I stated uh, last week, uh, all the guests who uh, are on the program get a t-shirt for free. I think that's the right thing to do. So they can expect that. Uh, And that will be the whole way back to the first episode I ever did. All of my guests up to this point and from now on are going to get a free t-shirt having to do with their particular case. All right, that's going to come from me. So, but, and this will be the the t-shirts that you see there will be the ones that they will be getting at unfound-podcast.shopify, my Shopify. Dot com. And then finally, just to get this out of the way so we can move on, patreon.com slash unfound is the Patreon site, and PayPal, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. There you go. Now that's done. Um, Stan, welcome tonight. Uh, good to see you. And Diane says, Diane, uh, a former um, guest on the show, a sister of Patty Action. Uh, first time I have a Wednesday off and can listen to the entire show uninterrupted. I'm usually at work and have to listen between customers. That's dedication, Diane. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I had a question. Uh, Kelly, who I – she said she was going to go to bed. I talked to Kelly uh, once in a while. She's on here in the comments section. She wanted to ask me about the piano. All of you have asked me about the trophies. Uh, she had asked a question about the piano. Um, I began playing the piano when I was five years old. Uh, I really had no choice, uh, because my mother was a piano teacher. My mother went to Duquesne university in Pittsburgh and got a degree in music. She was a music teacher and then she and my dad adopted me. And then that's when she'd stopped teaching. Uh, but she, uh, gave piano lessons out of our house from the late sixties until the early 2000s. So I grew up in a house where there was piano music always being played. Um, and so I, uh, I'm i a piano player, although that piano has not been played in a while, to be honest. Um, 
I kind of gave uh, Kelly, once again, you can see her in the comments section. I kind of gave her kind of a promise that maybe one of these days while we do one of these shows, I play something on the piano for everybody. That may happen. I, I guess I'll have to do it being I told her that I would, but it's, I'm going to have to practice a little bit. But that's the story behind the piano. I got that piano when I was in Las Vegas. And then when I moved here, we loaded it up into a uh, U-Haul with everything that I had at the time and then towed my car behind it and moved to Florida. So that's an upright Samick, S-A-M-I-C-K, uh, upright piano. And I think I've had that since about 2006. I think it's about 2006 since I, I got that piano. And I was playing in an apartment complex in Las Vegas, and sometimes I'd bother the neighbors, and there's some funny stories there. But that, that is the story uh, behind the piano that you see behind me. Uh, it's a pretty good condition. It has some nicks and things on it, um, but it, uh, I'm guessing that it's still in tune uh, and everything. So Tara says, yes, definitely. Yeah, Tara, uh, Leechburg uh, graduate like I am, I guess she would remember back to the days when I played the piano a lot more than I do now. Thanks, Tara, for uh, uh, remembering. Um, I want to talk about, and this should, should probably generate some discussion. Uh, I only have one news item for tonight, and that is the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. The reason that is is that today, January 24th, is the 12th anniversary of her disappearance. And uh, we had a good discussion going on in the group, the private group, the Unfound Discussion private group, about her disappearance. Of course, since I was just in Orlando, it kind of feels close right now. And being I live in Florida, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that uh, I think I should talk about it. And it's a case that I've, you know, I mean, you know, I've been doing Unfound for a year and a half. I'm going to say 10 years ago is when I probably started following Jenny, Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, something like that, maybe 2008, something like that, maybe on Web Sleuths. And, um, you know, I've always had the opinion. I want to let me just check something here before a moment, make sure I'm not missing any comments here. Just a second. Just a moment, if you could bear with me for a moment. Just want to make sure I'm not missing any comments. Sometimes this thing locks up. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, I've always been a believer the authorities see, you know, I, I have to admit that I did not watch the press conference today, Stan. So um, the authorities seem to have been trying to damage control. The family seemed unimpressed. <clears throat> you know, people forget, I think, you know, everybody's so caught up in what happened and everything. But there are many stories about the Orlando Police Department and how they handled it originally. Of course, now that I do Unfound, uh, that's not surprising but the Orlando Police Department got a lot of crap back at the time. And Jimmy, welcome tonight. Good to see you. Um, so we, that has to be remembered, I guess, is, you know, I kind of go through this. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that the family's unimpressed. And it, you may, may well be right, Stan, that they're doing uh, damage control. The authorities are doing that. Um, I've always been a believer that she disappeared on Monday night. Uh, I have problems with the idea that she was she got ready for work, stepped out the door of her apartment, and somebody or some group, bunch of guys, I guess, grabbed her, drug her down to the car, threw her in her own car, and then later that day, maybe four hours later or whatever it was, that car ends up at that other uh, apartment complex. I want you to know I've been outside Jennifer Kessie's uh, apartment complex over there, and I've actually parked my car in the exact spot where her car was found. So I'm familiar with the area. And they're really not that far away from each other at all, at all. You could easily, easily walk it. 
And um, getting back to actually what happened, I, you know, I know what an abduction in the morning looks like. You can think about something like Jody Husentrude's abduction, where she came out of her apartment going down to her car. Somebody or some buddies were waiting for her. And what happened? At 4.30 in the morning when she was abducted, people heard her scream. Her stuff was strewn all over the parking lot. Um, other people maybe saw a van. Uh, you know, her key was, um, the key was broken off in the door of her Miata. I mean, you could tell whatever, whatever happened there was violent and it was a surprise to her. Well, that's what people were trying to say with the Tuesday morning uh, scenario, but it's exactly the opposite. There's nothing. Nobody heard anything. Nobody saw anything. None of, none of, nothing of hers, of Jennifer's, were left in the parking lot. When they, got, when they eventually did find her car, there was no signs of violence in the car or outside of the car. Nothing. It's like the exact opposite of what happened with Jody Husentrude, Jody's case a definite case where she was abducted as she was going to work at 4030 in the morning. And once again, Jennifer would have been leaving at what, 730 in the morning when the sun is out, you know, neighbors are going to be out or whatever. Jody disappears at 430 in the morning and people hear everything. Jennifer disappears at may possibly 730 in the morning and nobody hears anything. Um, that's why I continue to believe that something went on on Monday night. Uh, Joyce asked, hi, Joyce, how are you doing tonight? Did Miss Did Mr. Kessie die in the last ten years? No, I think both of Jennifer's uh, parents are still alive. And Jessica, good to see you tonight. Good, good to see you. Um. So that's the main reason I try to compare Jennifer Kessie's disappearance to other disappearances that I know, and that's something that I, I commonly do. And I think I've talked about that on on found before. Hers, hers just does not give you me the signs that she was abducted as soon as she got out of the, there's, there's just no sign of that. There's just nothing. And then you add into it that if the phone records are to be believed, her phone was turned off the night before. At like 10 o'clock after she got off the phone with her fiance is when her, her phone was turned off. I think the key point there is that her phone was never turned back on. To my knowledge, once again, this is something I, I will admit that I have not listened to the Jennifer Kessie podcast, Unconcluded or whatever it's called. I've not listened to it. I just don't have the time. Uh, but I've, I've talked to a couple people who have, and they say that that podcast has not brought up anything about this, you know, her cell phone coming back on. But I've heard her, you know, her cell phone was bouncing all these different towers. I, I, I don't know. But... The common idea over the last 12 years is that she never turned her phone back on the next morning. Well, are you telling me that she got up, got a shower, got dressed, made her lunch, all these other things, and never turned on her cell phone? A businesswoman like Jennifer Kessie. That just does not make any sense to me. It just doesn't. I'm not saying it's not um, conceivable. I just don't think it's probable. And that's why I continue to maintain that she disappeared sometime after she turned her phone off the night before, that night, the Monday night, and not the Tuesday morning. Um, and I have to admit, people who try to maintain that it was Tuesday morning, it seems like I have to admit, and I had some discussions way back in the day with people who thought it was Tuesday morning, it's always felt to me like they were fishing. You know, they were submitting things, facts into evidence that weren't necessarily facts. And uh, I have a problem with that. Uh, as you know, that I have a problem with it on, on Unfound, the way I conduct my interviews, is that I try to take all of the guesswork out of it as I can. And Jessica, you're right. Sounds like Tyler's case, your brother's case. Absolutely. Too many questions and nothing being answered. Um, and... You know, when it comes to the Kessies, and you know that I am friends with every guest that has ever been on Unfound, and most of those are family members. Well, you can see them in here. Diane is here. Jessica is here. Joyce is here. All people who have been on my program, and I talk to these people even, even after they've been on the program. I try to help all of them even after they've been on the program. 
with the with the Tessies, um, there's a lot to be learned from them, a lot of good things, and I think some bad things. And this is, once again, from my experience, talking to over 60 families over the last year and a half. And Allison, you're here. Good to see you. You're getting right into the heat of the conversation. Welcome. Um, Lois, don't worry about it. You're, you're, you're great. We're, we're going to hit a lot of stuff here before it's all over. Um, I think a lot, I think families can learn a lot from the Cassies as far as keeping the word out there. Uh, I will be frank that it helps that Jennifer Cassie is an attractive, is an attractive young woman that helps. All right. That helps. And kind of the mystery the car being parked, the video that shows somebody, but you can't tell if it's a man or a woman. I mean, that adds to it, but the, the Cassies have done an excellent job um, keeping the word out there. I mean, they've been on, when Greta Van Susteren was on Fox News, I think they've been on other news channels. I mean, they've been all over the place, and, and I think families can learn a lot from them regarding that. Absolutely, 100%. And I congratulate them for that. For that. On the downside, I think that with the Kessies, they themselves have pushed at least every interview that I've seen, I've no, I don't know them, I've never talked to them, I've never tried to contact them, anything. That's never happened. But the perception that I have is that they've really pushed the Tuesday morning scenario um, a little too hard, in my opinion. And Allison, that was unfortunately the luckiest person who was on the video. You're right. Just happened, the face happened to be covered up by the bars and the fence. Allison, I, I can't agree with you more. That is just bizarre. You're right. Um, but I think the Kessies, you know, I, I one of the first interviews I ever saw with them, they were talking about a wet towel. Well, the wet towel outside of Jennifer's shower proves that she took a shower on Tuesday morning. It doesn't prove anything. Um, it doesn't. I live in Florida. I could go wet down a towel right now in my bathroom, and it would still be wet tomorrow morning. Why? Because Florida is humid. The water that's in towels and dishcloths and anything does not get soaked up by the air because the air is already saturated. It's 95% humidity or something. Now, if we were in Las Vegas, a towel like that would be dry in an hour. Having lived there, I know, where the humidity is 10%. It's just different. And it's the, the wetness of the towel is irrelevant if you don't know how wet it was when it was originally used. We don't know that. So you can't draw any inferences from the, the towel being wet. Um, there's another part of this, and this isn't to be derogatory or anything else, but um, you know, I, I said this to some other listeners I've had private conversations with. I think we all know what it means if Jennifer disappeared on Monday night. Okay? We all know what that means. We have to remember that her cell phone was gone. It seems that she picked out an outfit to wear to work. Her business papers and a suitcase and everything that she had, they were also missing, and she disappeared on Monday night. What it means, just to put it frankly, what it means is that she left with that stuff that night, and she was not planning on coming back that night. All right, I'm just going to put it, that way. Um, and I've always believed that her disappearance and her being on that trip with her fiance, and I, I'm not saying the fiance, I don't believe the fiance had anything to do with this. I'm saying something else. Um, I don't think it's a disappearance that she disappeared right after she got back from that trip. I think going on the trip and her disappearing are absolutely connected. I do not believe that's a coincidence. All right. Um, and the, uh, that's what I think I know. That's what I think I know. Um, you know, and I asked, maybe somebody else out, out there knows this, was, was Jennifer's phone charger ever found? I know her cell phone and the other cell phone she was supposed to ship back um, were never found. Was her phone charger ever found? That's a question that I have that I haven't been able to get answered by anybody within the last couple days. 
Um, if anybody knows that answer, I, I would love to know uh, what the answer is. That might also help me, you know, with some of my reasoning uh, regarding her disappearance. And Allison, you're right, it can stay wet. Um, it can. The, the, the towel is going to stay wet because this is Florida. And it's humid and things just stay wet all day because the air is so saturated. So it's a, it's a poor thing to use when trying to determine when uh, Jennifer left her house, left her apartment, okay? You also have to think about this way, and you know, and I'm not just talking about this because of the case. I think that there are things that we can learn from her disappearance. What, what can we apply to other disappearances that we know about, whether they're covered on Unfound or not? Because you know I'm all about education. I'm all about learning. I want us all to become better amateur investigators, amateur anal you know, analyzers of all of these things. That is what's going to make all these unsolved cases more solvable if we get smarter. And so we, ha unfortunately, we have to use these cases that have happened to educate ourselves. Um, you know, I look at, you know, for people who believe that she disappeared Tuesday morning, like she, when she was uh, leaving for work, you have to put, think of it this way. Nobody would plan out an abduction like that. Nobody's going to say, okay, I know that this attractive young woman lives in this apartment. I want to kidnap her. I want to do this. I want to do that. Nobody is going to say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand outside her apartment, and she's going to come out, and me and a buddy of mine are going to grab her, and we're going to throw her in her car and take her somewhere. Nobody would plan something like that out if this was planned, and that's what we have to believe it was planned. If people were waiting outside for her to come down to her car, then it was planned. All right, it was planned. I don't know if that means a day before or a week before. Nobody would sit out, you know, figure that, that uh, to do it that way. Now, I know what somebody's going to say. Well, it seems if that's what happened, they got away with it. That's true. But nobody would plan like that beforehand. Nobody could predict that they were going to plan something done broad daylight uh, in apartment complex where other people were living, take the woman's car, and then actually expect that they were going to get away with that for 12 years. Nobody would do that. Nobody would do that. And if this was something was just a spur of the moment, then it would have been more haphazard. You would have found Jennifer's things all over the floor, all over the parking lot. And you would have uh, maybe seen some damage on the car. And there probably would have been signs inside the car of, you know, her being in the backseat, her hair or anything like that. Nothing. It's nothing. Not that we, not the public has ever heard. And so that's why I maintain that she left the, the, her apartment complex in her car the night before. She went somewhere. Something happened. And then that person got somebody else to park the car where it was found. That's what I'm going to maintain until I get new ev evidence. Um, you know, sometimes it helps to look at these things. Um, Sometimes it helps to look at these things from the opposite side. Well, you know, get in the mind of the person who would do something like this. Nobody would plan it out this way if they wanted to get away with it. And if this was just some spur of the moment thing, I think something would have happened in her apartment, which it doesn't look like that. Once again, all of her business stuff is missing. Everything that she needed for work is missing, meaning somebody abducted her and took the time to put all that stuff in the car along with her. I just don't believe that. It just flies in the face of everything I've, I know about other abductions of women. Um, it just, you know, that's just uh, what I know. So uh, let me go through some questions here. Maybe she had another forms of communication track phones are easy to get now. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. It's never heard anything about that. Uh, Charlie, is there any indication that she was maybe seeing somebody else? Yes, there was. There's been an interview with a, there was an interview that I saw with a coworker of hers who said she was having a relationship with somebody else that she was working with. Uh, this guy 
uh, I believe has been questioned, and he, he's the guy, if you've heard, allegedly showed up work for late, showed up to work late that day that Jennifer disappeared. All right. So there's that. Um, Sarah, yeah, I think someone grabbed her uh, when she went to send phone back up that night. That very well could be. I, I, I'm Sarah, I'm totally open to that. But then we have to, I think, go further and say, well, she took all her business stuff with her that night. She took her paperwork and everything with her to go, you know, mail this phone somewhere. I'm not saying that that might not have been on her agenda of going out, but I, I have to, I'm just going to tell you, I don't believe that that was her main point. She might have stopped somewhere and was planning to stop somewhere. But obviously, she never made it because the phone didn't get mailed. If she went out that night, I do not believe uh, that mailing the phone was the motivation, simply because there are other things missing that lead me to believe that she was staying over at somebody else's house. She could maybe leave her paperwork in the car, but then why bring it home at all? Now, Sarah, I, I agree with you. I think that's a great question. But if she's going to keep her paperwork in the car, why bring it home at all? Why not just leave it at work? I don't know. We do, these are answers we don't know. I'm just trying to logically go through this. It's, 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 it's odd. You're, Nicole, the case is bizarre, bit bizarre, and there's not much to go on. I do think it's crazy that the police didn't search her condo when they had, had no idea when or where something happened for sure. Well, you know, part of that, Nicole, is that when Jennifer's family got over there, all these people – you know, kind of went in there and, I, you know, kind of dirtied up the scene, I think, is I, the way I remember it. Um, um, so, you know, there's that. And Tara, I think I missed your uh, comment there about the, the charger. Yeah, well, I know, you know, it happens. My dad ran away from family and then never, Sarah, I'm, I'm sorry to, Sarah, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, you know, uh, but I think in Jennifer Kessie's case, I don't believe she, you know, ran away on her own. I just, I, and I, on top of that, somebody asked me um, if she was chest, uh, sex trafficked. Uh, Tara, I saw you wrote something about the charger. Please write that again. I've lost that comment. So, Tara, if you're watching, please write that down again, and I will uh, try to uh, answer that again for you. Um, you know, somebody asked me, couldn't she have been sex trafficked? Maybe this is, you know, what's happened. Um, once again, I think my response in the group was that any woman can be sex trafficked at any time. However, if you look at the demographics of the, of the types of women who do get sex trafficked, and we know that because either their bodies are found or they escape, um, they're usually women who aren't independent. They're usually women who aren't educated with a college degree. They're usually not women who are living on their own and on and on and on. They're usually women, uh, you know, from other countries like Jesse Foster, who happened to be in the United States, was Canadian here. They maybe are women who are vulnerable. Uh, we talked about Ashley Kohler, who I believe was sex trafficked, got caught up with a madam in the Riverside uh, area of California. Um, we could talk about uh, Joyce is on here. We could talk about Peggy and Patty McDaniels, 17 year olds. And that goes way back to 1979. Young girls who I think were duped, were fooled into, you know, going along with the, you know, these two guys who were street smart. Uh, Jennifer Kessie, just in general, does not fall into the demographic of women who are most likely going to be sex trafficked. All right. Uh, sex traffickers stay away from even attractive. Uh, you know, business independent women because they're headstrong, street smart, and, and they're a handful. They are. They are. They they are going to fight back. They're going to do this and they're going to do that, and that's great on them. And that's and that's great. I think you know every woman should fight, but these women are going to be particularly obstinate. And sex traffickers, you know, that are going to do that, they're just going to look, frankly, for easier prey. And so I just don't think I'm not uh, saying that it's not possible. Um, you know, uh, it's just not very probable. If her charger was not found, then she was planning on leaving. Yeah, 
Uh, Tara, if you're saying that if her charger wasn't found, she took it with her the night before, yeah, that means she wasn't coming back that night. I, I think I agree. If, if that's what you're saying, Tara, then I agree with you. Whereas if her charger was found at home, that would lead me to believe maybe the Monday, this Tuesday morning scenario is more likely. She charged her phone. It's all charged. She's going to work. And we know back in 2006, phones held their charge much better than they do now because we didn't have all the apps and everything back then. So if she, if the charger was found at home, then I guess I'm going to maybe have to think about the Tuesday morning scenario. If her charger wasn't found, then I think she took it the night before and was going to charge it overnight staying somewhere else. And um, over the years, when I've gone on Web Sleuths, and it's been a while since I ever, you know, did anything on there of any um, extent, um, used to go back and forth with a lot of people on there uh, about these points. And so I've had a lot of time to, you know, really think of it. Yeah, Nicole says, I agree with you. It's unlikely she was picked up for sex trafficking. I think it was someone she knew. We ever do an episode on her case. Um, huh. uh, I suppose if the Kessies wanted to come on my program, I, I mean, I'm not going to turn them away. But if I'm going to talk to them, I'm going to talk to them like I talked to all of you. And I'm going to ask them about Monday night. Is it possible that that Jennifer went out. And, you know, I'm going to have to ask them some very tough questions. And I don't think that these, those questions are wrong. And in fact, I think that Jessica and, and uh, Diane and Joyce, all these uh, guests who are in the, the group tonight, who were watching this, they know that I ask tough questions behind the scenes. You know, there's a lot of conversations uh, that all of you never hear about. But they all know that I ask very difficult questions. I have to, I, I want to really know, make sure I understand. And, um, and I appreciate uh, all the candor and frankness that I've received from so many guests over the last year and a half. Uh, I would have to do that with the Kessies. And we would have to have an extensive conversation about the Monday night scenario. And is it possible that Jennifer had another man in her life besides her fiance? And I remind you also, if some of you don't know, her ex-boyfriend that night was only a half hour away at the Blue Martini in the, in the mall nearby. So there's that. These would all be things that we would have to talk about. And I don't know if the Kessies have ever really talked to a reporter, investigator like myself, uh, that extensively. My impression is that they do interviews and it's, you know, like when they were on Fox News, it was complete softball interview. And uh, whereas I think that all options uh, need to be explored. Yeah. And Diane, I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. It's not because I'm not, as you, all of you know, I'm not trying to make any missing person look bad or anything. I've covered drug dealers, a couple women who, who were prostitutes. I don't care. What I do want is a thorough interview that, ex that um, covers all possible angles because that's what's going to help them. That's what's going to help. It doesn't help covering things up because you're afraid of a reputation here and something. That doesn't help anybody. It just doesn't. So, uh, it, you know, um, you know, uh, yeah, Tara, you have to get the whole story, and that's what I try to do. That's what I try to do as much as is possible. And um, so if the Kessies ever wanted to be on Unfound, uh, I'm not going to turn them away. If, if they were to email me and say, let's talk, we're going to talk. I'll talk to them in person. I'll talk to them on the phone, whatever, Skype, I don't care. But my job as a reporter is to ask tough questions. Just the way it is. Uh, so that, I don't know how that would affect them. I don't know how they'd feel about that. Maybe I'll find out if they see this video and they contact me and then we'll know. And then all of you will know. Um, you know, I don't know. I haven't watched or listened to, uh, un, un, you know, what is it? Unconcluded or whatever the name of the podcast is. Not because I don't know the host. I don't know anything about it. Uh, simply because I'm too busy. I, you know, I hardly listen to any other programs um, simply because I'm too busy. Uh, when I'm doing work at home, I have my heavy metal music on. 
Um, so uh, that's just what I do. So I can't listen to these other shows. So I don't know if, um, you know, to what extent all of this stuff has been explored. And I don't know the Kessie's um, attitude toward, you know, what's been going on in that podcast. Okay. How old was her brother when this happened, Sarah? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think he was what our younger brother. I, I don't know. I have to admit, uh, I probably knew at one time, and I don't know now. So I just think that there's a personal angle to this case that has nothing to do with sex trafficking, or you know, I have to admit that somebody emailed me about you know her, the people who own the business that she worked for. They're a bunch of freaks. Somebody talked. Uh, I talked about uh, that with a listener uh, yesterday. I think this is very personal, like most missing persons cases are, um, like most murders are. It was somebody who knew her who did something. So, uh, and I feel that way, and I think if you go back through Unfound's cases, you're going to find in a large majority of them, although we don't know exactly what happened, we suspect that it was somebody the person knew who caused that person to disappear. So I think we've, uh, I think we've covered that. Um, uh, we've spent quite a bit of time on that. I just wanted to get, um, that all out there. How many others were at her apartment with her brother while she was gone? That's something else, Sarah, that I don't know. I'm sure they covered that on the other podcast that is doing exclusively on her case. I, I probably knew at one time, but it's been a while. So I apologize. Uh, I guess this would be a good time to answer Stephanie's question. She asked me this question. Um, before is there are there any cases that that scare me is that how you I know Stephanie you're in here uh, still uh, any question any cases that scare me no no there are none there are none I mean as you know I've gone after you know we talked about with Shannon Turner's case the biker gang um, in Kelly Rothwell's case we talked about David Perry who is a really really bad guy who didn't live too far from where I live now at one time I'm not. I'm not afraid of covering any case. I'm. I'm I think that's what you meant, or you know. I think you said that we used the word spooked, Stephanie. I think that's what. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Um, however, there will, would be some cases that I'll stay away from because I just don't want to get in the middle of things. Because uh, there are many cases. Of course, Mar Murray's case is one that comes to mind, where it seems that. It's like a fr it's like fraternities and sororities in college. It's like you have to pick one. You know, there's cl it, there's cliques about what you know, and if you're not you know if you're not on my side, then I'm going to come after you. That's the kind of stuff that I'm just going to stay away from. All right, uh, I just don't want to get in the middle of it at all. Uh, in addition, so I'm so from a safety point of view, no, no, I'm not I'm not spooked by any case that's out there. Anybody who comes to talk to me, I'm going to talk to him. I don't, you know, uh, I can't, uh, you know, there's nothing that I've encountered so far with anything that I've done that scares me at all. And all of you have seen my video with me shooting a gun and I am a concealed carry holder and all of that. All right. So that I, I take all precautions that I can. Um, but no, there's no case. The only thing that I will just stay away from cases if I think they're just too crazy. And it's just going to be, um, you know, it's just going to be a little too difficult to cover it because it's just going to bring a bunch of trolls and everything into my life. And that's just not what I need. That's not what I'm found these. Plus, there are a whole bunch, there's thousands of other cases and people that I can talk to. Um, Charlie, I can't stop thinking about April Pitzer. Yeah. Yeah. She was another one who was mixed up with some bad people. Um, once again, people who know her probably are the people who caused her to disappear. You know, she, I don't think she was sex trafficked or anything like that either. So let's move on to this week's case. I was telling, uh, I think Emily is in here. I was just telling her earlier, this is going to be the third case we've covered on Unfound where the last name is Wells. We had Claudia Wells, we had Brandy Wells, and now we're going to be covering the disappearance of Tamala Nicole Wells, and we're going to refer to her as Nikki. Um, she disappeared in Detroit, Michigan in 2012, and the interview for this case 
is going to be her mother, Donna Davis, who happens to live here in Florida. And the opening for this episode, I talk about pain. Uh, you're going to hear uh, in, in Donna's voice, uh, she's in a lot of pain, as are all of my guests due to the disappearances in their lives. But I thought this was a good time uh, to bring up how, you know, I've certainly got an eye opening in the last year and a half. I realize that I don't know what emotional pain is. Okay. Um, I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows how these families really feel. And so I've been thinking a lot about that topic and I wanted to convey that at the opening of Friday's episode. I know about physical pain and, but I've had loss in my life, but you know, my parents are still alive. My brothers and my sister are still alive, but I've, all my grandparents are deceased. You know, I'm 47 years old. They've been gone for a long time, but you know, I don't think any of that compares to what these people continue to feel every day. So that is the theme for, uh, yeah, the, it's, you know, I, that's the theme for this week. I, you know, I just in, in interviewing Donna and she's in so much pain and I thought that it was a good time to talk about it. And so the episode uh, for this Friday, the title of it is called Knowing Pain. And um, it's the disappearance of um, Nikki Wells. And it's very much like Brian Sullivan's case from last week where there is a good suspect. Last week it was Derek Murray. And this week it's going to be her boyfriend, but he's still walking around a free man, even though he has made um, some bizarre statements to Crime Watch Daily and some other places. But the police insist that there are, isn't enough evidence. Um, and so th this is the case. It's another case where, very much like I said, Brian Sullivan's or Kelly Rothwell's with David Perry or Jesse Foster's with her, her uh, pimp that she had in Las Vegas. It, this one falls into that category where there's a pretty good suspect and it just to this point doesn't seem like enough has been enough evidence has been gathered but we're going to hear from donna you're going to hear about what she's gone through and we're going to get more into the facts of the case and um and i've already posted in the group the link to the interview that uh nikki's boyfriend ricky did uh, and i hope you watch i hope you'll watch it before friday so you can get a little bit of a flavor of what he is all about he is a piece of work so that is this friday's case the disappearance of Tamala Nicole Wells. She disappeared in, in um, Detroit, Michigan in 2012. Um, just about done here. It's the longest show yet. Um, um, Diane, I mean, some of the, the high-profile cases where they take sides and come up with wild theories, yeah, I, I stay away from that stuff. Uh, Sarah, are you asking me about uh, Nikki Wells? She lived in Detroit. Uh, I don't have the exact address uh, of where she lived, but um, she was in Detroit, Michigan. And Jennifer Kessie, if you're talking about Jennifer still, uh, she was in Orlando, Florida, uh, kind of on the – kind of um, before you get to downtown Atlanta, uh, Orlando. Uh, Christina, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, but that's all I have for tonight. I hope you enjoyed. Um, the show tonight, like I said, this is my favorite time of the week, talking to all of you. All of you take time out um, to uh, talk to me, give me some questions, and I enjoy the back and forth that all of you provide for me. I deeply appreciate it. Just want to remind you again, books on Amazon, makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast, unfound dash podcast dot my Shopify dot com. Uh, I posted those earlier. So some of those of you who tuned in late, I posted those right on the video back then um patreon and paypal keeps this show financed uh, anything two dollars a month or to to start anything uh is welcomed and i thank you very much um with that i'm going to leave you uh for wednesday night you will hear me on friday i want to remind you we got two interviews on for, uh, friday donna davis about nikki wells and then i'm interviewing Stephen Huba from the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh about the case we covered together.
the disappearance of Amy Pugner that will be on TribLive.com on Sunday. All of you have a great night. You've been watching Unfound Facebook Live. Good night.